Now let's look at the uh, classifications within the balance sheet. The major breakdown of classifications in the balance sheet, of course, are between the financial statement elements, assets on one side and liabilities and equity on the other. From a very uh, simple perspective, a very simple approach, we can understand assets as anything of value that the company owns, that is, what the company owns. Liabilities represent claims on those assets held by creditors that is, those who are lenders to the, of resources to the business. And owner's equity uh, represents that residual claim that owners hold. In one sense, you can imagine or understand every asset as having some claim on it, um, like creditors and, and owner's equity claims all sum to the amount of total assets. So every asset has a claim on it of some sort. Very basically, assets can be understood as what the company owns, liabilities what the company owes, and owner's equity is that residual ownership claim. Assets are further classified as current or non-current, with a non-current divided further among PP&E, intangible assets, uh, long-term investments, and other assets. Liabilities, as we'll see, are also classified as current or non-current. And then owner's equity uh, includes capital or common stock, additional paid-in capital. Those two make up what we call paid-in capital, and then retain earnings. So we've used uh, those, uh, those titles when, uh, and worked with them before. There are also some hybrid forms of securities that sometime or, sometimes arise, and their classification depends on their specific features. For example, convertible bonds, that debt that will become equity if uh, certain circumstances uh, come about. Preferred stock, uh, that is equity that has some of the features of debt, uh, as well as some of the features of equity. And so these represent hybrid securities that we will address later on and have to uh, identify either as, as debt or as equity. Now let's look at some formal definitions. It's, uh, I mentioned already that you can very basically understand assets as the resources owned by a business, anything of value the business uh, uh, owns, or what the business owns. <laughs> uh, assets, though, from a more technical perspective, uh, are, are defined as probable future economic benefits obtained or controlled by a particular entity as a result of past transactions or events. And so we will, if you memorize this definition, we will in time as we cover the various assets in the remainder of this semester, uh, uh, we'll be able to address and say how is it that cash fulfills that definition? How is it that prepaid expenses or inventories, or you name any assets. How is it that these uh, fulfill this, this definition? Probable future benefits owned or controlled by a particular economic entity as a result of past transactions or events. Liabilities represent probable future sacrifices of economic benefits. For most part, when uh, we have uh, obligations or liabilities, we're going to have to give up an asset. Uh, generally, cash is going to be the actual asset sacrificed. It may not be the only one, but there is a sacrifice of economic benefits, in other words, a sacrifice, sacrifice of an asset. So liabilities are probable future sacrifices of economic benefits representing present obligations of a particular entity to transfer assets or provide services uh, to other entities in the future as a result of past transactions or events. Equity, also known as net assets, is the owner's interest in the assets of the entity that remains after deducting the liabilities. In a business, this equity is, is the uh, residual interest. The owners are always last in line, and that's something we'll talk about in the future, that debt represents a prior claim, a first claim on assets, and, and income as well, as a matter of fact, uh, whereas the, ec the owner's claim is always, they're always at the end of the line, so we characterize their claim as a residual one, whatever's left over. Okay, let's go down through the assets now and, and define these. First of all, uh, current assets are cash and other assets a company expects to convert into cash, sell, or consume either in one year or in, in one operating cycle, whichever is longer. For the most part, most companies' operating cycles are going to be shorter, well short of a year maybe as few as 30 days, 60 days, something like that. But you may have some types of operations I mentioned in class like long-term 
construction projects or shipbuilding, where in fact the process of actually producing and selling an item of inventory, whether it's a building project or whether it's a, an oil tanker, may in fact span you know, uh, two or more uh, actual fiscal years. So in that case, we would uh, define current assets differently uh, for those type of projects. Um, an operating cycle, by the way, sometimes called the cash flow cycle, is the period of time required from the time cash is paid to purchase inputs in the production process uh, or the income generating process to the time the cash is collected from sale of the finished goods. You can imagine maybe a manufacturing process where you have to order merchandise, you receive it, then you pay for it. That's actually technically when this cash flow cycle or cash flow uh, period starts. And so from that time then you, you pay money for the inventory, you pay workers, you incur other expenses, you produce the goods, you uh, package them, maybe ship them to the client, maybe you allow the client to pay uh, on account or to purchase goods on account so they don't pay even at the time of the sale, but maybe 30 or 60 days later. When you get the cash <laughs> from the sale of those items, that's when that cash flow cycle or operating cycle is complete. And so, uh, in, in essence, what we we're looking at is from that period of time, from the beginning of that cash flow cycle to the end, represents a time when the company essentially is, is out of pocket the cash that it has spent. From the time it spends the first dollar in the production process to the time that it receives payment for the uh, revenues uh, for the finished goods that it, that is sold. And uh, so that operating cycle, that's, it comes into play here in defining current assets because, again, assets are classified as current. Um, if the company expects to convert it, the, uh, uh, convert it to cash uh, or consume it uh, within one operating cycle or one, uh, one year, whichever is longer. Current assets are presented in the balance sheet uh, in order of liquidity. So cash is coming first. Very often, maybe some kind of um, marketable security or short-term investments, accounts receivables, inventory, uh, and so on. Current assets include these, and as a matter of fact, these for the most part uh, identify the uh, order in which you would generally find current assets in the, uh, in the balance sheet. Cash equivalents, by the way, represent very short-term investments, uh, temporary storage place for excess cash. That's one way of looking at it. And cash equivalents are short-term investments, but they are short-term investments that have a, a life, a remaining term to maturity of less than 90 days at the time the company buys them. Marketable securities also represent short-term investments, but what you would include in here that would, you wouldn't include as a cash equivalent is those short-term investments that in fact are going to take longer than, uh, let's say, have a maturity longer than 90 days, uh, but less than one year. Accounts receivable, prepaid expenses, inventories. We've seen uh, we've seen all of these things. Short-term deposits. You know, there are a number of other potentially uh, uh, type uh, unusual or let's say less common types of current assets. But these certainly are what we would have to regard as the biggies. Um, well, here's I uh, described uh, cash equivalents, very highly liquid investments. An exception uh, to a literal interpretation of the current, de current definition uh, of current assets involves depreciation of fixed assets and amortization of intangibles. Um, this is a little bit of a side, I suppose, but just realize that if we've defined a current asset as that asset that's going to be used up, with or converted to cash within the next year, we say, well, what about that value of that? fixed asset like equipment that we're going to actually use up or that copyright that's going to expire within the next year. Uh, technically that represents a, a current asset but uh, we don't generally, well we wouldn't, uh, not just generally, we wouldn't, we wouldn't recognize that as that portion as a current asset by virtue of tradition and, and practice. Any restrictions on the general availability of cash, by the way, or any commitments on the pro its uh, probable disposition must be disclosed. Uh, you might, for instance, have cash sitting in the account, but you really can't access that. Maybe you've got an arrangement with a bank to restrict that use of that cash. So technically it doesn't represent, in one sense, available cash to you. But that would be something you would disclose in financial statements, so it would generally be handled uh, that way.
rather than to sort of exclude that cash from your, from your cash pres presentation on the balance sheet. Short-term investments are usually categorized as held to maturity, trading securities, or available for sale, but we deal with that in uh, the next semester even. Any anticipated losses due to uncollectibles, the amount and nature of any non-trade receivables, and any receivables designated as collateral should be clearly identified. So these are part of the disclosures that um, would have to be made when you've got certain conditions associated with your access or realization of those, uh, a certain of those current assets, uh, like receivables in this case. For a proper presentation of inventories, the basis of valuation has to be disclosed. Whether you uh, applied the lower of cost or, or a net realizable value rule and the method of pricing, uh, the, the cost flow uh, assumptions you're making, FIFO, LIFO, or average costing. So these disclosures, by the way, some of the, these will generally take place in the notes to the financial statements, which we look at at the very end of this particular uh, lecture. Long-term investments. Um, these are items um, uh, classified as long-term investments uh, in the balance sheet, and they really fall into four categories. Investments in financial assets, also known as securities, uh, such as common stock, bonds, or long-term notes. Sometimes companies, of course, will uh, buy the, the stock of other companies, sometimes uh, for, to build up a controlling interest, or uh, to have some influence on that company's operations. Um, you also find, may find companies will buy corporate or uh, government bonds uh, as long-term investments or possibly for trading purposes, short-term short -term gain uh, potential. Investments in land not currently used in operations, such as land held for speculative purposes. It's something to note here that when you look on the company's financial statements and you see under property, plant, and equipment, you see land, you know that that land is actually being used. That is, the company has a building on it where it's being used somehow to produce income. If the company has bought a, a piece of land, maybe uh, for potential future use to build on, but it does, it's not really using that land in, uh, in its operation, it does not do anything with it, that in fact that land represents an investment and so would be categorized as a long-term investment. Investments set aside in special funds, sinking funds, uh, pension, uh, should say, uh, pension plan, uh, uh, pension plans, uh, money that is being accumulated for uh, expansion later on, maybe for expanding a plant or maybe for purchasing uh, other businesses. Those sorts of things uh, also need to be identified and disclosed. That is the intended purpose if, it, if there is a definite one at the time. Cash surrender value of uh, life insurance policies owned by the company, generally maybe on the lives of, of key employees. And then investments in non-consolidated subsidiaries or affiliated companies. Companies where it has a, the company has a substantial or uh, even a controlling interest. Long-term investments are rather permanent in nature, uh, not normally disposed of for a long period of time, and so they're shown in the balance sheet below current assets in a separate section designated investments. Property, plant, and equipment we're familiar with. I think properties of a durable nature uh, that are used in the regular operation of the enterprise, we call those fixed assets sometimes. Examples are land and improvements, buildings, machinery, uh, equipment, furniture, uh, tools, uh, transportation equipment on down the line, including what we call, uh, well these are all really in some sense called wasting resources. With the exception of these, uh, of land, these assets are either depreciable or depletable. Depletion is to natural resources like timber or uh, petroleum extraction, natural gas, uh, coal, and other ores. Um, those are natural resources. Depletion is to natural resource uh, assets what depreciation is to physical fixed or plant assets, P to PP&E. Intangible assets lack physical substance. Their benefit is in the exclusive rights that they convey to the holder. If a company holds a patent, for instance, uh, to produce a on a particular product, no one else can legally produce that product as long as that patent is, uh, is in effect. Uh, most uh, intangible assets have, a, have a, a limited life. It's defined by law, and we, again, we'll discuss these later on. Patents, copyrights, franchises, uh, trademarks, trade names, and so on. 
Uh, limited life intangible assets are amortized over their useful lives. Amortization is to intangible assets what depreciation is to uh, tangible fixed assets. Indefinite life intangibles, for example, goodwill, are not amortized but are really, really evaluated uh, at least annually for impairment. That is a significant loss of value. And if it's determined that in fact that, um, uh, that uh, goodwill has in fact lost value, it's not worth its recorded value, then we would write down that, uh, that value. We'll find that in fact when you do that, that loss is permanent. If there is an increase later on or in the value of that goodwill, you don't go back and, uh, and recover that. At least under GAAP, you don't. Other assets. This is a bit of a catch-all uh, category. It occurs after intangible assets and includes a wide variety of items that don't really uh, necessarily fall clearly into one uh, of these other classifications. Deferred charges. Uh, we'll see um, uh, in prepaid income taxes, essentially which tend to be of a long-term, certain of them, but a long-term nature. Uh, Non-current receivables, uh, prepaid pension costs, uh, deposits, long-term deposits, advances to subsidi subsidiaries. These are going to be some uh, unusual items that, frankly, we won't deal with uh, very much, even in uh, Intermediate 2. But or at least, you know, you want to be aware of the, some of the kinds of things that might, you might find there for a company. Let's turn our attention now to liabilities, first of all by looking at current liabilities. Current liabilities are obligations that are reasonably expected to be liquidated either through the use of current assets or the creation of other current liabilities. You know, once again, we have a uh, sort of a seat of the pants uh, definition that says, well, current, uh, current liabilities are those obligations that come due within, within one year. And most of the time, that is uh, it's true. That is um, a good definition, a good working definition of current liabilities. But the fact is, and we, we cover current liabilities even um, in more detail next semester, that there's a more refined or let's say more uh, technically correct definition than that, as you see here. Examples of current liabilities, accounts payable, that's probably the one most of us uh, recognize and think of as a current liability, short-term notes payable, advances from customers uh, that we have ever seen. These represent more or less like earn, unearned revenue. We've seen uh, examples of that. Um, current portion of long-term debt, taxes, uh, income taxes, or even other types, property taxes payable for that matter. And then accrued expenses like uh, wages and salaries and interest. You know, there's uh, uh, there is a, a difference between accrued expenses and, say, accounts payable. Uh, accrued expenses tend to be associated, that term at least, like accrued interest expense or accrued salaries and wages expense. We could have an account called salaries and wages payable, but accrued salaries and wages expense or accrued salaries and wages really is a, another alternative term for the same thing, accrued interest expense. We generally would maybe call that interest payable. We're probably more comfortable, you know, with, with that term. But we need to be, you need to be aware of and, uh, and not be thrown off by, you know, that, uh, the, the reference to the accrued or an account title that, accrued, that includes accrued. What that generally is associated with, the notion of accrued, is an expense that um, occurs over time, that increases over time. Interest, for instance, on a loan is generally stated as an annual percent but we've seen that we have to calculate the, the interest uh, for a given period based on the amount of time, uh, well, the principal times rate times the time that that loan was outstanding uh, during the period. Uh, the same thing goes for salaries and wages. You know, we, we understand that as time passes and our, our uh, workers provide their services to the company, then we incur, as uh, the, the company incurs an expense related to their, to their efforts, what they have contributed. 